Welcome everyone. My name is Brian Medina. My pronouns are Z, here, and here's, and I'm the program manager of Bias Incident Support Services here at the University of Maryland College Park. Welcome. Hopefully you are here for the purpose of Truth to Power, managing and supporting effective activism on campus. We'll have our panelists introduce themselves in a little bit, but we first wanted to center ourselves and welcome you into this space and place by saying a short land acknowledgement alongside any relationship with the Piscataway Kanoi tribe. Next slide, please. Every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them, around the world, who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to migrate from their homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. Next slide, please. We believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who are among the first of the Western Hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to Piscataway elders and their ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. You'll see in the chat that there's also a link for those who want to explore and understand and be in a relationship more with the Piscataway Kanoi tribe, again, here in the University of Maryland College Park, we would like to honor and be in relationship with one another. For those of us joining us today, if you have accessibility um, interest, we also have live transcript enabled on your Zoom screen at the bottom of your screen. If you click that live transcript, you can see that accordingly. We also, throughout the session, will open up opportunities both in the chat and for the Q&A. So please, we encourage your questions. We encourage your engagement in this topic. Many of our facilitators and co-facilitators will be there alongside you to answer some questions and then also potentially elevate those questions to our panelists. If you can go to our, our next slide, please. So we do have some resources. We'll provide these toward the end as well. Um, but we did create an infographic, credit to Nicole Garcia Diaz, who's not with us unfortunately today in this time, uh, but in spirit, she is with us and shared this at a prior panel. So for those who have not been able to take a look at our prior panel series, we certainly encourage you to do so. And again, we'll share some of these resources toward the end as well. You could drop the share screen for me as well. Thank you so very much. So again, welcome each and every one of you. Grateful for you to be in space with us. Our hope for you today to be an ongoing part of our series around free speech, but to have both internal and external partners uh, availing themselves and their expertise, their lived experiences. This is meant to be more of a conversation. Yes, we'll certainly be sharing some insights that are kind of more global, maybe some citations and resources we'll put in the chat, but the hope is that this truly is a conversation for us one and all. So again, grateful to be with you. And as your moderator, I just really is more facilitator. I'm a support for our great panelists as they're conversing with us today. I'd like for each of them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about not only their identities, how they show up in this space, but also how free speech involves itself within their work. Kaylin, would you like to start us off with that? Sure, yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Kaylin Schultz. I go by she, by, she her pronouns. Um, I am a second year PhD student in the Department of Communication here. Um, I study rhetoric and political culture. So rhetoric is all about studying um, civil engagement and how uh, we can engage in society uh, effectively. So I'm really interested in tr trying to understand how people negotiate power in our civic discourse. Um, I'm really interested in, in the messages specifically surrounding social movements, particularly those concerning the cultural regulation of reproductive bodies. Um, 
And also I am a uh, public speaking instructor here as well. So for any of you who might be in COM 107, that is the course that I teach. Um, and so I spend my days thinking and talking about the messages that we are constantly negotiating. Sure, I can go next. Uh, no pressure being following a public speaking professor. Uh, but <laughs> my, my name is Emerson Sykes. I'm a senior staff attorney at the ACLU's national office, uh, and I'm a First Amendment litigator. Uh, before coming to the ACLU in 2018, uh, I was a, a legal advisor for Africa at the International Center for Not for Profit Law. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I come to this work. Um, as an African American, as a Muslim, as a parent, uh, but also with a background in international human rights uh, and having seen what happens when there is no First Amendment and the government has authority to silence and jail folks uh, simply for their thoughts and ideas. So I look forward to the discussion today. Hi everyone, my name is Caleb Jackson. Uh, I currently, ser currently serve as policy counsel at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law in Washington, DC. Um, where I work on a blend of topic areas, primarily voting rights, but also some criminal justice work and some educational opportunities work. Um, prior to arriving at Lawyers Committee um, about a week ago, I was a voting rights litigator at Campaign Legal Center, um, and speech comes up very often in voting rights litigation. Um, it's honestly one of the only laws that is around protecting voting rights uh, litigation right now. So I bring that uh, aspect as well, but, and then also I graduated from UCLA, UCLA Law in 2018, where I specialized in critical race studies. Um, so CRT is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm also able to work on, you know, fighting back against some of these attacks against CRT. Um, and I personally, I come to this work also as an African American, um, someone who's born and raised in Texas in the South. All of my family is from uh, Texas. So I'm very interested in these issues and know how the First Amendment can both protect us and, you know, sometimes harm us. So I'm excited for this conversation. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Marsha Gensler Stevens in my real life. Uh, I direct the Stamp Student Union. I also have a faculty appointment, so teach students every semester. So I'm very grateful for that. But my colleagues and I and others on campus are often responsible for creating space for free expression, I'm often responsible for the way that ripples through the campus community and affects individuals and communities of people. Um, and I would tell you, uh, having been at the University of Maryland for a very long time, some of my most significant teachers in that time have been activists who uh, came up strong and hard against either that space being present or not finding um, enough volume for their voice. And I have learned a hell of a lot from uh, really wise students. So I am very grateful to be here, but I would also um, say that one of the things that I was responsible for in the last few years was really um, taking a good long review with a group of colleagues at the Free Expression Policy at the University of Maryland, which was approved by the Faculty Senate in uh, September of 2020, and then affirmed by the president. So, so I have dived deep into what the words are, if that's of any help. Grateful for you, one and all, and just not only your expertise and how you show up into this space, you know, we joked, joked a little bit before folks joined us, the dynamic by which we talk about this, the complexities, the nuances, you know, I hope that through this conversation, attendees benefit not just from the wisdom that the, you bring, that us as a group brings, but that each other brings, that as you're entering into space and hearing from one another, uh, your lived experiences can be wisdom, can be gleaned, and also pass along in ancestors be, um, thereafter. So I guess for our first question, you know, I'd love to turn to you, Kaylin, to, or, or Emerson, actually, to start us off, to really think about how you would explain free speech to maybe the common person like myself who may just not be familiar with it um, in common practice. Emerson, would you start us with that conversation? Sure, and can you hear me okay? The audio is fine? Yeah. Sounds great. Great, so I think, you know, free speech has become a, a sort of cultural buzzword. Uh, and I think it's fair to say, you know, when we talk about uh, free speech, when I go to campuses to work with student activists, 
one of the first questions I ask is, how will students understand free speech? Because it has become a term that has been somewhat weaponized, I would say, and co-opted, and has come to mean in many circumstances, sort of the right to be offensive. And when we think about free speech, it's really about, you know, are people in power allowed to say whatever they want without repercussions? That I would I would argue is a is not a full picture of what I think should be understood when we talk about free speech, but I think it's important to acknowledge that that is sort of often how it's used in in normal parlance. I mean, I I get into conversations a lot with people who say, oh, the right likes free speech, but the left doesn't like free speech, and I'm like, are you kidding me? We just spent ten months defending the right to protest for BLM and other related movements night and day, day and night. How is that not free speech? So I think free speech as a term, as a term of art has taken on a certain set of connotations, uh, but I think free speech is much bigger than that. I'll also say, so I'm a first amendment litigator and people sometimes use the first amendment and free speech interchangeably. And just if you'll indulge me for one moment, the First Amendment is you know, in the Bill of Rights, and it says that Congress shall make no law with respect to five freedoms, the freedom of religion, speech, assembly, the press, uh, and the right to petition the government, right? So the, the point of the First Amendment is to restrict government's ability to regulate private speech. It is purely about government action. If there's no government action, there's no First Amendment interest. Uh, so that's why when we talk about Facebook, Twitter, other private entities, the First Amendment does not apply. However, free speech is much broader than just the First Amendment, because there are free speech principles that are involved in trying to have as robust uh, public discussion as possible, uh, having as many ideas and, 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 and viewpoints uh, that, are, that are in the sort of uh, public discourse. And so I think when we talk about free speech, it's easy for me as a First Amendment litigator to sort of say, oh, that one doesn't have state action, therefore it's not First Amendment, therefore I'm not going to do anything about it. And that might be true in terms of litigation or court cases, but I think free speech gets at some fundamental principles about how we want to live in a society together that go far beyond any sort of constitutional or doctrinal issues. Thank you for setting the tone here, Emerson, and certainly expanding our horizons around uh, the terminology we just use as colloquial statements, but don't actually refer what are the real sources behind this on the legal sense, on the more cultural or kind of global sense abilities. And so grateful for that. Um, I am interested, Marcia, to kind of think about that and hone us back into a more campus environment, how that, you know, what is free speech in that context, maybe more particularly? Sure. Um, to some extent, free expression is a wide variety of things, right? You're you're angry about a particular policy or the world, something has happened and you feel you need to speak out. Um, sometimes it is the opportunity to be in community to speak out um, against something because of the pain for something. Um, and so sometimes that takes the form of um, performance. It takes the form of uh, gathering or uh, candlelight vigil, but it also takes the form of protest and march. And uh, so it, it's all of those things. Um, most recently, one of the things that we've seen a lot is in the time of COVID, when we couldn't be in each other's company, that there was critical need to be in each other's company, right? And whether that was in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, or if it was as a result of murders of Asian American women, right? That there was this need to be in each other's company. And, and even thinking strategically, how do you create free expression that's also publicly health related sound in that way? But part of it is the power of sometimes finding allies or folks who um, speak of the same issues or issues that you do. But I also think it's critically important not to think about the fact that often for every um, sort of act of free expression, there may be folks who see the world differently than you do. And so it's also how we create space on campus for those um, sort of streams of thought or speech to come together. Um, and, and how do you both hear maybe what the other's saying, but, but also have your own space where you can speak loudly of you know, your own position uh, as well. And, and most often on our campus, that is, you know, faculty, staff, students, students most particularly, 
But on occasion, it is also folks who are not of the campus who want to exercise their right to bring a message, right, as a lecture, maybe that's being hosted by someone on campus, right, or as someone who's not necessarily hosted by anyone on campus, but wants to make a point to our audience. And so um, that's that external party as well. You tie me in very, very nicely, very neatly with, uh, you know, follow up that I wanted for Kaylin as a part of this question, you being kind of in this dynamic of students, of lecturer, thinking about this really from the academic side and academic freedom elements, how free speech may also entangle itself in the classroom setting as well as around campus. Certainly. I mean, of course, these these issues are just so there's so many different avenues that we need to discuss in order to really have a thorough conversation. Um, and I know later today we are going to talk about some of the actual protests that have occurred on UMD's campus. Um, but when it comes to like academic spaces, it's really important that um, we kind of start to come to terms with the fact that uh, Campuses in general um, are, are conservative enterprises in a lot of ways in that they, the ideologies that like keep them uh, going are going to disproportionately impact um, normate bodies. So bodies that um, are, are, uh, are part of the dominant narrative, white heteronormative um, and masculine identities, like these are the people that uh, these systems have been built for. Um, so when we have laws, uh, like the First Amendment or um, things that have been established in these systems, the the default of like normal or neutral uh, application of these kinds of laws in uh, academic spaces, it's not, there is no such thing as neutral because those are going to already be prioritizing um, dominant perspectives and uh, identities. So, you know, I think something that I have started to kind of come to research is this difference in like thinking about freedom of expression in this context of justice rather than fairness. Um, it, I'm really thinking about like what Emerson said about uh, how freedom of speech has kind of become this weird like excuse to be offensive, right? But if we instead of think about like instead of thinking about quote unquote equal protection of the law and instead really think about like who these laws were made to protect, um, it's fine to have differences of, of opinion. But what about the bodies that are being harmed by by the, the expressions that are happening in spaces? So when we are you know on campus and we have to be in these places and you I have to go to class to teach my class and then if I run into a protest like I have to engage even if that engagement is just me going past it and then as what happened this past fall what happens is the protest that is happening near or around my academic space um i then have to address it with my students of course because if there's like really intense messaging happening right outside our door i can't just pretend that's not happening especially um if a huge part of my course is talking about persuasion and effective means of persuasion um, and ethical means of persuasion. And what it really, what what we really need to be considering in um, discussions of like what the power that our messages wield, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think I think a lot of the times um, when we are trying to participate in civil disobedience we do need to think about protecting our own futures and selves. Um, at, just not to bury the lead here, but I did get in trouble and had to go through uh, the process of student conduct because of my experience uh, counter protest. Well, I, I wouldn't call it counter protesting because of my own lapse of judgment on a day where I was, uh, and we'll get into it further later, but um, it can really, you have to figure out what it means to participate in these spaces meaningfully um, and, and really think about harm as it pertains to freedom of expression and making sure that the harm is not disproportionately imposed upon, um, you know, people that are trying to work towards progressive ideologies. Love that and grateful, Kaylin. Of course, for your self-disclosing, we'll get to some of these pieces later, but as vulnerable as you are for us to show how we also are learning from this, right? It's, a, it's an evolving process for each, each of us, our communities, 
um, for us as a, as a campus, as well as a country, as a world, for us to do this um, better. And so, you know, finally, I want to lean into Caleb. Caleb and I mentioned about some of the kind of policy and law implications from the classroom setting, but I'd love for you to tag on to that. Any kind of additional thoughts you have to this conversation? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, what Kaylin said about, I think, you know, the framing of the First Amendment and the framing of free speech um, is very important that it's not this neutral uh, principle that just protect, it's meant to protect everyone. It was originally meant to protect certain kinds of speech. Um, and I think that, you know, now things are especially coming to a head with all of the anti, you know, CRT um, bills that are passing. As Emerson said, you know, previously we thought of like attacks on freedom, freedom of speech or attacks on the First Amendment. Those have typ typically been framed as attacks on conservative thought um, and conservative movements. And now we're seeing, you know, all of these attacks on principles or ideas that are more liberal. Um, so it's an interesting moment right now. Um, I, I think that I just want to emphasize what Kaylin said, that that framing is so important, um, that when people, when you're having these discussions with people, make sure you emphasize that, you know, these principles, these laws are meant to protect certain people. Um, and they are, I guess, uh, you know, just to put it in framing, for example, if you're at a school that's 5% Black, um, and there's speech going on that is especially harmful or especially negative towards African-American students or Black students, then of course there's a power dynamic that's applying to that speech as well, um, that the law doesn't always take account for, um, and that these conversations around freedom of speech don't always take into account. So. Great. Ryan, I don't, I don't want to usurp, but can I jump in? Please jump in. I want you to usurp. <laughs> Speak freely, so, friend. <laughs> thank you so much. No, so many amazing things and important ideas were brought up um, by Kaylin and Caleb and Marsha. I just wanted to react to a couple of them quickly. One is the, the sort of unique, this is maybe presumptuous of me because I'm one of the few people on here who's not on a campus, but I just wanted to put a finger on what Kaylin was talking about in terms of going to class, the need to go to class and coming across a protest on the way. And there is a very special thing about campuses where they are where students live, they are where they study, they're where they work often, where they socialize, where they eat, all of these things, right? And so outside of campus life, I don't have to, you know, eat across the table from a political opponent, you know? I don't have to do all these things in a sort of cauldron of, of free speech. You know, I get to sort of retreat to my space. I don't have a bulletin board outside of my hall. Uh, that you know anybody can post anything they want on right outside my door, right? So I just want to put a finger on the sort of unique space that 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 a campus is, and what and the huge amount that we ask of folks to exist in those in those types of spaces. We have this ideal of academic freedom in higher in institutions, and that's something I am passionate about. Uh, but it is also you know a, a huge weight to bear, uh, and I probably don't need to tell tell you all that. I do think. One thing about, you know, sort of the need to address the harm of the speech, my, I, I find myself so often in the, in, when there are, this is not a debate, but when there are debates, sort of pro-free speech and anti-free speech, I generally find myself agreeing with one side on the problems and the other side on the solutions, right? So I fully agree that, you know, the U.S. Constitution and all of our institutions uh, of higher learning and otherwise have deeply embedded white supremacy and all of these you know things that we have called out here today and all of the sort of deeply problematic things that are at the root of many of these issues i would say that the first amendment our current understanding of the first amendment is actually not that old and was crafted in large part by you know aclu cases uh, and so you know it is much more of a sort of modern conception this is not inevitable this is not something that was there from from the founding, uh, but I think you know, my it's not that I disagree with the assessment of the problem or the or the complicated you know nature of the First Amendment. But the question I always come back to is, okay, what are when, when we say we agree that we need to address this harm, how do we do that? And so the only thing that I would posit is that empowering government entities, including public universities. To have more authority to silence certain kinds of views is a very dangerous road to go down. 
Uh, and that's not to say that there's nothing we should do, but um, doing away with the problem doesn't necessarily mean uh, muting the ideas or censoring the ideas, whether or not that even works is one question. And how that will come back to bite us, I think is quite inevitable. You know, the folks who are on the margins, the folks who are pushing back, the folks who are trying to change things around them are always gonna be bearing the brunt of, of, of government authority. Hey, Brian, this might be a good time to, to even talk about how groups like ACLU help us to sort of refine policy. So an example, uh, ACLU uh, sued the University of Maryland, um, and at the time, it's President Dan Moat, and it was on issues of free expression where there are third parties, outside entities, who wish to see the public institution as a public place, like a shared park, a, a, a way in which it's the town square. And the question was whether those individuals, right, from outside of the institution could uh, use any space on campus to Emerson's earlier point about, you know, sort of space you live in and go to school in and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and I think ACLU in the case was arguing that it was a public place, right? In some ways, the court said, yes, but, right? And they said, yes, but. Um, you can sort of assign time, place, and manner, right? And, and, and we still want to make sure it's sort of in the public square, as close as you can get to that. So at the University of Maryland, the public square, sort of that southeast patio out front of the stamp, and it's Hornbeck Plaza, right? And so this becomes an issue in a later entity where, where we say to, to external guests, you know, like faculty, staff, students, your public square is wider, it's broader. It can be, you know, outside of your academic building. It could be, you know, in front of your residence hall. But for an outside entity, your public square is somewhat more limited by um, this particular um, court finding. And, and I think that's important to know because I, I think there are some ways in which, you know, we, we do seek to regulate in that environment in which you fully live in, right? And so that's an example of that. love where this is going. And somebody from the audience is even asking about this as a part of our next question. You know, so the person in the chat, I guess, mentioned, how does hate speech fit into the First Amendment, if it's present at all? And, you know, for us, it's also important to ask how free speech has been used to liberate, oppress, and everything in between. Kaylin, would you like to start us off on this one? No pressure. Sure. I mean, sure. Okay. So um, I, there's like so many things that I could talk about right now. I think, I think I, this discussion of the public square and like the regulation of it and public spaces in general is really interesting to me um, and how people get to express themselves. I mean, we opened this with a land acknowledgement, like spaces and places are not neutral, right? And when you allocate space and amplify voices, like that's doing really important work to, to decide like who, which narratives are allowed to be in what spaces and when, right? And I, I think that that's a really important part of this discussion. I'm gonna be honest, me trying to address hate speech, um, I don't think that I'm super equipped to do it. I, I will say that I think I have found that it seems like the First Amendment and freedom of speech is often used as a way of justifying hate speech, right? Like it's often used as like, um, you know, I should be able to say whatever I want because it's protest, but protected um, from the Bill of Rights. But at the same time, that's not, freedom of speech doesn't even really exist, right? Because we talk about, we talk about you can't yell fire unless there's a fire. Um, you, there's, you know, the, these arguments about like whether or not like certain forms of freedom of speech, certain forms of speech have always and already been regulated. and um, if there's like an undue harm being caused by messages, it seems like um, being protected by the First Amendment in those situations what is counterintuitive. So yeah, I'm not sure if I really even answered the question, but th that was my input. <laughs> Caleb or Emerson, particularly as the experts in the room around law, let's let's lean into that. I'm I'm happy to go next. I mean, the my non-legal answer is that free speech will not set us free, right? Free speech in and of itself is not the answer. Uh, I think 
you know, the reason that I am passionate in my advocacy of free speech rights are for two things. One is because I think we all have inherent rights as people to our ideas and to express those ideas, right? So if we start from a place of universal equality, I think that is, you know, an easier way to get to the idea that people might be able to have views that we disagree with, right? If we start from a place of universal equality. The other thing is that it's, it's more sort of an instrumentalist view, which is that free speech in and of itself is certainly not gonna set us free, but we are gonna have a very hard time creating the change that we wanna see if we don't have robust protections for free speech. It's not inevitable. It's not to say that that's, you know, that's all we need, uh, but it is certainly a key component of what we need. And if I can just, Ben Blake asked this question in the, in the chat, and there's a lot of interesting pieces to it. It's like a law school hypothetical. There's so many nuggets in here. Um, but it says, in theory, does the First Amendment mean that the federal government cannot regulate calls on Twitter for violence against people of color? And then about hate speech. So here, there's, this is a really interesting one. So can the government regulate calls on Twitter for violence against people of color? So as we said, Twitter has its own First Amendment rights, right? So you can't sue Twitter for silencing you uh, under the First Amendment. But unlawful activity on Twitter, including true threats, conspiracy to commit violence, all sorts of things that are unlawful, even unprotected by the First Amendment, the federal government can still do it. They just can't hold Twitter responsible. That's not really because of the First Amendment. That's because of Section 230 of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which basically holds that platforms can't be held responsible for content that they don't create. Um, so it's a, the, the relationship between the federal government, Twitter, and calls for violence is complicated, but it also comes to the question around unprotected speech. And this gets to what Kaylin was talking about. She said free speech doesn't really exist because, it, because of these, some, some things have always been regulated. I would argue that that means that free speech is not absolute, right? There are categories of unprotected speech. In the United States, we understand those categories as very narrowly defined. These are harassment, uh, defamation, incitement, true threats, obscenity. Now, these are just buzzwords that might seem like they cover a whole lot of things, but the way they're defined in American legal culture is very, very narrowly defined. So for example, in obscenity, that's the one that's most problematic actually, because that has been uh, interpreted more broadly, but it's really supposed to be things that have purely purian interest with no redeeming artistic value whatsoever. So properly understood, that's a very narrow category. Incitement is another one that I have worked on and written about quite a bit. Uh, and that's one we often see on Twitter, which is how are you gonna hold one person responsible for the unlawful or violent actions of someone else? And the idea there is we wanna have a very close nexus between what someone said and what somebody else did. And if we're gonna hold them responsible based on their, their words, right? It's not just enough to go on Twitter and say, man, I really hate X, Y, and Z person, a public official, policy, whatever it is. I wish someone would do away with this. Even I wish this didn't exist. I wish someone would, you know, do something violent. And then someone somewhere goes off and does something, right? Like we, we really want to insist on a very close connection. In, under incitement doctrine, you have to be, in, it has to be intentional that the unlawful action would occur. It has to be objectively likely to result from the speech and it have to, has to be imminent, right? So there can't be a long time delay. So this three-part Brandenburg test was created in an ACLU case a long time ago. And we have argued passionately that whether it's a Black Lives Matter, whether it, even on January 6th, whatever the situation might be, we need to be very careful about holding folks liable for other folks' un unlawful actions. We have a, a, a case that went up to the Supreme Court around DeRay McKesson, which is really about this, this, this exact question. Um, and finally, hate speech was not among the unprotected speech categories that I mentioned, right? It's not, an un it's not unprotected because the Supreme Court has found offensiveness, even bigotry, is a viewpoint. And the sort of most fundamental point about the First Amendment is we really, really, really don't want the government discriminating based on viewpoint because we're worried that they will inevitably use that to crack down on people that disagree with the government first and foremost. It might be right now that we agree with some parts of our government, whether it's the president, some parts of the legislature, your local government. There's a lot of different government entities. So you might say, oh, I would, wouldn't be my, I wouldn't mind if 
you know, Joe Biden were drawing the line, uh, you may, you might <laughs> indeed not want Joe Biden to be drawing the line. Uh, but you know, it's not hard to imagine what would happen if somebody else were in that position of power. And sort of the, it always comes back to this question of, okay, we might agree on what should be said and what shouldn't be said, but the question is who gets to decide. Pre uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions called Black Lives Matter a hate group, for example. So by his definition of hate speech, we might all be guilty. And he called the uh, NAACP a communist group. So <laughs> there's that. But I, I just want to piggyback off, you know, what Emerson said. I think where this is a very important conversation because I think now more than ever, the word violence and what we consider um, violence is completely separate from what is legally defined as violence, right? So to me, as personally, I'm not a lawyer, not thinking about what the Supreme Court would say at all. If someone comes up to me or even tweets at me and calls me the N word, that's violence. You've already started the violence and how I respond, if I respond with physical violence, that's okay because I take you just saying that, calling me that as violence. Legally, that is not violence, right? So what, what he was saying about, you know, obscenity and, you know, if someone says something that's extremely offensive, um, that they are free to say that. And if I react physically, then I'm responsible for the actions. They won't face any consequences. On the other hand, if someone says, you know, let's kill all the N-words, that's violence, right? Legally, that is violent. So what he, what he was talking about, if someone goes on Twitter and says, I think tomorrow at six o'clock, we should all meet um, at this mall and kill all the N-words. Okay, now that is violence. That, you cannot do that, right? But more, more than ever, right, I think we, and you know, correctly so, we identify, even if you're not taking those drastic steps, if you're just using certain words, or if you're speaking in a certain tone, we've begun to identify that as violence and doing harm. Um, and unfortunately, legally, that's just not the case. Um, and so I think, you know, he, he was also talking about January 6th, right? This also comes into play when you're talking about when people are using figures of speech, right? So if I say we have to fight, you know, we have to fight like hell. This is, a, I think, a phrase that came up in January 6th. You know, people say, you know, we have to fight like hell. We have to fight until we can't fight anymore. You know, that's something that activists use all of the time. But the, there's also a question of, well, if you say that when there are 10,000 people trying to go into the Capitol um, and then they go do that after you told them to fight like hell, okay, is that violence? Are you now directing them to do something or are you just using a figure of speech? So these are all like the murky legal questions um, that I'm sure Emerson and I, I love, but unfortunately, I think the biggest, the biggest piece is that, you know, what actually feels like violence to us is not always violence, you know, legally or in the law. Marsha. You know, I was sitting here thinking about there's the legal and then there's the holding the mirror up to your face as a institution that has aspirations. So, you know, I was, I was listening to you, Caleb, and thinking about how we talk about this uh, sort of theory of belonging. We want everyone to come to the university and feel like you belong, right? And, and you can be your whole self, right? And you can belong. And so when that Twitter feed finds its way to you, you feel like it, it, it isn't just about speech. It's about that you were sold a bill of goods, right? You were told that you could come to this institution and fully belong. And now you have evidence you cannot. Right, and and so I think it's like, um, again, holding the mirror up to the institution's face and saying, where which is more critical, uh, free expression or or this innate sense of belonging, right, or institutional uh, embrace of of all persons. So I I think that's it's an interesting one. You asked the question though, Brian, which I think is an an interesting one when you started about liberation and oppression, and, and we got into the hate speech uh, category. A and I'm reminded, and you know you're old when you can do history, right? I, I, I remember having to work with students who wanted to build a shanty on the middle of McKeldin Mall, right? And it was really about divestment of holdings in South Africa. And we had all these rules about nothing can be permanent, but they had the shanty on wheels, and they would wheel it out, and then they would wheel it away. And it was this, it was this, this 
moment of education for a lot of folks, even in the act of doing that. Later, I would come to have this very dear friend, Desmond Tutu, and he would say that, that the college students who sort of spoke out loudly when folks in South Africa could not speak out loudly was critically important in creating a narrative. And, and I think about, um, you know, the students at the University of Maryland of McKeldin Mall who were saying you gotta put wheels on the bottom of your shanty are part of a larger movement. And so, so sometimes I think that, that liberation isn't just of an individual or of a, a single institution, but it may be a, a movement that gains traction. It may be a global statement, right? And, and I think we see that. And we also see players in that. When, when the Clarice Smith, Performing Arts Center opened, they did a performance of the Laramie Project, right? It's in the aftermath of Matthew Shepard's death. So they do this piece of theater. But in reality, Westboro Baptist Church, who's not of Maryland, decides this is their chance to get a public hearing about what they feel about LGBTQ plus people, right? And this piece of theater is a way to attach that message. So suddenly we're having to make space for folks from the Westboro Baptist Church who speak hate to speak out against performance that's being done in a brand new performing arts center and then make space across the road for our university community to speak out against the people who are speaking out against right the the performers and and suddenly it becomes this really complex situation but but it's critically important because if we don't sort of figure out how to create space for this discourse, th then there appears to be this way in which, to Caleb's earlier point, you made a statement by what you what you said, what you did, right, without meaning to make that statement. But but I do think, you know, that idea about liberation or the idea about oppression are, are real. And sometimes it's who gets to come and whether or not you create equal space, right? And sometimes it's a ripple effect. This dovetails nicely. Thank you so much, Marcia, for really sensitizing yourself back to the question about liberation and oppression. You know, where um, somebody um, also asked in the Q&A, um, thinking about the concept of law being the minimum standards accepted by society. And so our next question is asking us, you know, how do we speak truth to power to organizations and our personal circles toward justice and positive change? So if indeed you know, we're seeking after liberation, still incorporating the complexities and nuances therein, but not necessarily saying the guidance it has to be just the law. I'd love for folks, you know, maybe Caleb next, if you could share a little bit about kind of moving beyond law and how we speak truth to power. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the first of all, if you're not a lawyer, I do not suggest that you allow legal principles to guide your life. I'm not saying engage in illegal activity, but don't allow Supreme Court <laughs> cases to govern how you interact with others. It is a terrible uh, blueprint for actual human interaction. Um, but, you know, Brian, like you said, you can't just think about, okay, is this legal? Is this not? When you're in your interactions, when you're engaging in conversations with people, you know, think about how can I speak my truth? How can I say what I need to say? And how can I do it in not, a, not just a passionate way, um, but in a way that others will understand. I think specifically, you know, right now, something that our country is struggling with is people who have different viewpoints being able to have conversations and, and discuss, okay, I believe this. I firmly believe this. That not only do I believe this, but this is something that's deep in my bones. It is not just my belief, it's who I am. Um, and being able to recognize that, okay, there may be somebody else who feels the exact same way, but is on the opposite side. Um, so being able to speak your truth, um, being able to understand, you know, kind of be able to understand how, that when you're speaking to someone, they may feel, like I just said, that the same way you feel about an issue and the same way that you feel, for example, about CRT, the way I'm passionate about CRT, there's someone who is just as passionate about banning uh, teaching Black History Month in public schools. So be understanding that and being able to continue to speak, don't allow that any opposition to your beliefs or to your truth um, to stop you from speaking, I think is most important. Uh, 
I, I just want to second Caleb's advice not to look to the Supreme Court alone. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot, I, I do a lot of workshops with student activists uh, to try to give them the tools to make decisions about what to do when these, these issues in inevitably come up on campuses, right? I know UMD is not Im immune to this, but it's by no means unique to UMD, right? Every year on some campus, if not every year, every other year, every few years, something comes up. Uh, and I think, you know, when, I, when I'm working with students, we try to have, give them space to ask the hard questions about the First Amendment and to really work through some of the tough issues. I think part of the problem with so many free speech advocates is that they treat these questions as clear and easy because they're clear and easy in Supreme Court jurisprudence, right? But they are far from clear and easy. And I think we have to respect people's legitimate concerns. And you know, young activists are trying to overturn so many assumptions that we have around how our institutions are created and operate. And I think that's that's to our own benefit, right? And so it shouldn't be surprising that folks are also questioning our conceptions of free speech. I submit that as we you know, tear down so many of our institutions, the ideals of free speech actually serve a real uh, purpose that we all really need. And those should, not, those should be questioned and interrogated vigorously. Uh, but they should not be thrown out uh, with the bathwater. I mean, I think, you know, as I talk to administrators, and Marsha, I know you and your colleagues are in an ex especially difficult position. You're educators, you're there to work with students uh, to create these communities, and yet you're faced with these very thorny constitutional questions quite often, and you are sort of the deciders who are going to, you know, have to defend your decisions in court when some annoying folks from the ACLU try to file a lawsuit. Um, but I think what I tell folks is, is generally, you know, when these incidents occur, uh, you know, they're primarily community issues, right? There are ruptures in the community. And First Amendment's important, free speech is important, the constitutional guidelines are important. But first and foremost, it's a community issue, and we've got to figure out how to heal, how to heal as a community. And so my work with student activists is to try to give, as I said, give them the space to, to discuss these issues. Also, you know, make my best case for why free speech is an important value. But then we also do um, simulations where we pull from the headlines, you know, a controversial speaker comes to campus, somebody puts something offensive in their Zoom background, you know, there's a uh, offensively themed party on campus. You, you can sort of fill in the blank with the hypothetical. Uh, but then we sort of have students role play as they are student leaders, but they also role play as student leaders. And we go through the practical steps. What are you gonna do in the first five minutes or the first, when you first hear about this incident in a class, you know, a professor says something offensive in class, what are you, are you gonna hold a, a meeting? Are you gonna convene your group, whether you're the BSU or the environmental law group or the college Democrats or the college Republic, whatever role they assign, really practically, you know, with in the back of your mind, you have all the sort of key principles of the First Amendment, but now let's put rubber in the to the road and figure out, are you going to put out a list of demands? If so, what's going to be on that list of demands? Are you going to hold a protest? Are you going to have a counter event? There's so many different options for how students can respond. Some of them are blatantly unconstitutional. Some of them will get you put in jail. Uh, some of them, you know, <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of different ways that you can react. And as attorneys, you know, we are not there to tell you what to do or not do. You know, civil disobedience, Caitlin mentioned civil disobedience has a long and successful history in our country. Sometimes people cross the line to make a moral or ethical or even legal point. So if you're gonna, I'm just wanna make sure that if you're gonna cross those lines, you know full well what you're doing and what the repercussions are gonna be. I wanna empower folks with the knowledge of where those lines are even if they're going to toe right up to them and peek over, uh, or if they're just going to run right through those lines. So I think, you know, the strategic question around what we can do to respond, there's a wide menu of options, and student activists are extremely creative and have come up with all sorts of ways of, of pushing back. Uh, and as I said, you know, it's just important to keep in mind that some of those, including ones that actually inhibit someone else's freedom of speech, so-called deplatforming, going from counter speech to prohibiting someone else's speech 
it's a hard line to draw. It's, it's a very fact specific inquiry in a particular situation. Uh, but sort of having an understanding of those 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 key concepts, I think, can only help activists. And I think, you know, uh, my hope is that moving forward, folks can figure out, you know, the best way to balance these different interests, though it's, it's never going to be simple or easy. Um, you know, Brian, I, I'm thinking about what Emerson just said about community issues, right? And I think one of the things that happens on campus as well is that we don't all think the same, right? And so uh, a student group may choose to bring a lecture, right? Or or even a comic or a performance group, right? That that speaks of a certain viewpoint and others find it incredibly offensive. Um, probably the most clear was when one group brought uh, Louis Farrakhan, right? And then uh, a week later, groups who found incredible offense in what Louis Farrakhan was saying brought Meyer Kahani, right? And, and so, it, it was of the community, right? Two different student groups are bringing very different people um, to speak and, and using student fee money to do it. And here's the interesting thing is suddenly it is of the community, right? Because these are your friends who've chosen to do that. And you have to figure out how to Emerson's point, not in simulation, but in real world, how are you gonna to continue to serve on the Student Government Association or whatever it is together, because now it's, it's, it's laid bare. You all are setting us up perfectly with the simulation talk. You know, our next interest was really to go through a case study that we've referenced now a few times. You know, I'd love Kaylin to start us off, but I'm gonna read the scenario aloud. I think folks are gonna also mention or put uh, the Diamondback coverage of this in the chats just for folks that aren't familiar, that you can be aware of it for later terms. So last semester, fall 2021, there was an anti-abortion protest on campus that deeply impacted UMD community members. An external group came to Hornback, Hornbake um, Plaza and exercised their First Amendment rights. The group had graphic video footage of abortions, printed photos, as well as had signs and individuals on loudspeakers. Uh, many students were upset, avoided the area, as Caleb mentioned earlier, and several classes in that area were disruptive. So the majority of individuals are also wore body cameras from this group. So the question about like who gets to record what and in what capacity in spaces like that. Um, so how might you <laughs> advise members of the UMD community to address this type of situation? And Kayla, I'd love for you to talk about some of your lived experience, and then we can kind of learn about some things, what else we might try to explore. Yeah, so this is, of course, a really interesting um, issue. And, you know, I think that I have learned a lot of lessons from my experience here and um, would like to just kind of act as a cautionary tale um, in that, you know, I, I was teaching in the plant sciences building, which is right off of um, Home Big Plaza. And um, for, you know, three hours, I had my students coming in being like, did you see the large billboard videos of fetuses being dissected, which is like what was happening, right? Like really visceral images. And of course, like we're not going to not talk about that. Um, and so I kind of came off of this three hour discussion of being like, you know, you can't give these people energy. They, they, use, they use their freedom of speech in order to provoke um, in order to provoke people, onlookers, in order to violate those, and then they can like sue you, and you can really like reap some financial and legal, uh, 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 you know, consequences if you engage with these people. And I knew it, and I was saying it the whole time, and I still walked out of this place, and I knocked over a sign, and this was kind of the this was kind of the beginning of my. Um, my academic misconduct, which has been resolved. So I am, what I will say is I'm lucky that this, I, that I was able to negotiate some of this stuff, but other people are not going to be as lucky, potentially people that don't look like me, right? Um, who are interacting with the police on a college campus in a counter protest might not be as lucky as me, right? Um, so that's something that's really important is to kind of learn to protect yourself. We, we are as students and as um, instructors and people entering the workforce who are gonna have these like marks on um, your record, whatever that might mean to you. Um, we have to be careful that like all of the people trying to do the good are not gonna just be in jail, right? Um, 
deliberation is a really important thing and learning how to do it in a way that is productive and not harmful to yourself or others is like really critical. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's partially my, like my, the dissonance with these kinds of events for me um, is that I agree that people should be able to express themselves, but when groups like this or, um, you know, really racist groups expressing like hate that is experienced as violence to people, right? That feels viscerally and material, like uh, it, uh, an attack, right? That that does not count as legally harmful. But then if your reaction, if you react because of that harm, then you are the one who's going to get in trouble. And like, I am a living, breathing example of this having happened, right? Um, so, you know, these are really important things to consider. Don't screw yourself over, you know, you don't, you don't want to mess up your life over, um, you know, a, a, a second of not considering some of these like really intentionally harmful messages. Um, and so with that said, I want, there's a lot of other things I'm sure people might have to say. I was curious um, because of the example that Marsha had brought up of the Westboro Baptist Church and like making space for that. Um, I'm curious, like, how the process of finding out about these people coming to campus and then what is what do you inform the how do you inform the public about such a thing like how might counter protests even know that that's happening and that you've approved the space and like what does that process look like i think it's a great question kayla um so in the instance in the case study that brian uh, mentioned and you talked about uh, walking into um, that was a case where we had uh, prior knowledge, right? Where the group gave us knowledge that they were coming and they met with us and we detailed for them, you know, time, place and manner, right? Um, that's not always the case. And, and so you have this really hard decision to make in the moment when suddenly a group shows up in the middle of McKeldin Mall wearing body cameras, hoping to elicit a, a, a reaction from students that'll look really good on their website or in a political uh, discussion, right? And and students assemble, and then you have this really hard decision to make about public safety. And do you move that group to the appropriate assembly space? And because you have no info that they're coming. So in the case of the uh, anti-abortion group, we had knowledge they were coming, they were compliant. We also um, had made the decision that the front line of sort of defense on um, working with our students as they interfaced with this was not the police to own, but it was, was staff to own. And so um, th that typically means a lot of folks from uh, the stamp and from student affairs. And there's a growing group of folks that will be uh, monitors in circumstances like this, trying to give you an opportunity to divert if you need to divert, talking to you about reactions and interactions. Um, we, we did a, a, an interesting set of signs by Hornbeg saying that there were um, visual images of surgical procedures. Uh, we didn't sort of judge, we were very content neutral, but wanted to alert you to the fact that there were surgical procedures being detailed here. That seemed unusual to the group that was there. I, I don't think other in institutions would do that, but, but SGA later would uh, put together a piece of legislation asking for more trigger warnings, right? And so to my two legal friends, you know, like, what does that look like, right? Where, where do we step over the line and look like we're, we're, you know, judging content and, you know, at the behest of these groups, we'll see them later in court. Um, oftentimes, we are negotiating with the aggrieved parties. Um, at the same time, we're negotiating with individuals who are seeking space for free expression. So whether that's Westboro Baptist and we're talking to theater students and LGBT, like the Pride Association, like and 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 you know any number of other colleagues across campus, how to create that space, right? Uh, or you've got like a concert where the lyrics of the artist are so wholly hateful that you're trying to think where in that concert venue can you create? So the policy really speaks about counter protest, counter speech, and, and what does that look like? You know, and, and how you can even be in the same room, right? And 
And what does that look like? Yale Law School right now is really wrestling with how, how do you be in the same room, right? And and we have some policies there. They, you know, you can't bring sticks, signs on sticks, for instance, but you can bring a sign in, but you can't cover the speaker, right? And you can't cover people's ability to see the speaker. So, so there's some ways in which we're creating space often outside of the venue, but also sometimes inside the venue. So I, I think, um, and and I'll leave it to my legal friends because I, I do think we're we're all teetering on the edge of what is a trigger warning to, and and how do I give you advance notice so that maybe you make a choice to totally avoid the place when you're in a place where you really don't want to deal with. It. Yeah, I think Marcia, that you raise a very good point. I know when when I was in law school at UCLA, um, there was an event where an organization, student organization invited speakers, which happens all of the time, right? Like there are so many different views. People invite speakers that like a certain set of students will not agree with all the time. But in this instance, they booked like the main classroom. So the hallway that you literally, there's no way to get anywhere in the law school without going through this hallway. And they set up these books um, that were very, very like cringy. Um, and very like hateful towards Muslims. Um, and so it was an incident like this. Once, once again, this is a situation where you have to go through this hallway. There's no way to get anywhere in the law school without it. So I came upon it because I was walking in and I saw one of um, my Muslim friends crying and I'm trying to figure out why she's crying. And then like someone else points me to the book. And so we, once again, like I said, the law and like actions don't always match up. So we see these books and we're immediately like, oh no, this, not, this is not about to happen. We go over to the speaker, you know, first we try to handle it, you know, in a, in a way that is legal, say, you know, can you please just put these books down? Because I believe there were like three different titled books, but only one of them was like specifically harmful, specifically mentioned Islam, something about like Islam being a terrorist group, like the religion itself being related to terrorism. Um, and so we tried that. They were like, no, we're not putting them down. Um, then we tried to block the books. So we were like, okay, well, if you're not going to put them down, we're just going to stand in front of the books so that no one is able to see the books. Um, that didn't work um, because then they got faculty involved. Then, but luckily we had, I'm not going to say his name, but we had a faculty member um, who was an ally and who literally like grabbed the books and put them in a box, which I'm sure Emerson, I'm sure that was not legal because um, this was a public university, but he did do that. I, 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 there was some flat, some blowback after that. Um, so what we did going forward, because like I said, <laughs> he, I don't think he was supposed to do that. Um, and something that we employed going forward was taking up space in panels or in events when we knew there was going to be a speaker that we did not like, you know, similar to this event. What we started to do was just fill up the event as many of people who oppose the views as possible. And so this was perfectly legal. There was no issue here. And what we would do, um, organizations did not always like it because of course, you, as an organization, if you're hosting a lunch, you pay for the lunch. So we would all RSVP, we would eat all the lunch. <laughs> and then once it got time to Q and A time, we would ask all the questions. So it was a way to, you know, still be within um, not only the code of conduct, but be within the law but also take up space and make sure that our voices were being heard and that you know voices that we thought were hostile to us and other groups um, were not being able to just take up space freely and you know do harm to communities that we cared about. Well, Caleb, don't I mean I'm a free speech lawyer, but I'm not a snitch, so don't worry about your UCLA prof. Um, I mean I think what it, it brings up is how complicated these situations are, right? Kaylin, Marsha, Caleb all described these very specific situations. How big was the sign? How long was it there? Where was the book placed? Which way was it facing? Was it in a box? Was it not? Like, these are very detailed things that really, you know, are, are complicated even for folks with a great deal of expertise. So it's just, you know, just to, to name that. I think the other thing that Marsha brought up that I think is worth mentioning is the issue, the concept around government speech, right? So, the University of Maryland as a government entity has an obligation not to discriminate based on viewpoint, right? They can't say we're inviting some speakers, but we're, well, you can, well, 
you can't, they're not allowed to say, you're allowed to say this on campus, but you're not allowed to express this viewpoint. But the University of Maryland can invite whoever it wants, right? It's a different thing when it's student groups who are inviting these folks, which is more often the case than the university itself. But the university, for example, is not necessarily obligated to have both sides of an argument. They can choose which one they want to promote. The government can speak on its own behalf, right? So again, the First Amendment is about government regulating private speech. We don't want the government regulating private people's speech, but the government can speak on its own behalf and express its own viewpoint. So very often what we see are universities trying to figure out how to respect someone's free speech rights while also trying to distance themselves from them. And this is, I think, the question that Marcia was asking. And I think there is a way in which, it, you know, you can denigrate somebody so much that, you know, you're functionally getting close to inhibiting their right to an audience. But I think really the, more often what we see is universities, you know, to be honest, what usually happens is universities take way too long to respond, in which time mistrust, distrust grows. Another thing that I've noticed in terms of university responses is when I talk to students and, and faculty, they don't only when about incidents, they don't just talk about the incident. They start talking about what happened last semester and two years ago and 10 years ago before any of them were even on campus, right? Like these things have a, a history and they build on each other. And it's almost never about one particular incident. Uh, and the other thing is universities often sort of say, put out some mealy mouthed <laughs> response saying, uh, you know, this doesn't reflect who we are as a community, which is my pet peeve, because by definition, that is who we are as a community. Uh, we can maybe try to move forward from it, but that is exactly who we are. Um, but I think, you know, again, I think, you know, universities sometimes are caught with, well, First Amendment says we've got to be hands off. And between shutting down speakers that you don't like and doing absolutely nothing, are all of the good and creative ideas that we've been talking about, about how you can respond in these really tough situations. And it is fully within the university's right to say, you know, we don't agree with this person and they have the right to speak uh, and you have the right to protest in these, in these ways. And if you overstep these bounds, you're gonna face, um, you know, you're gonna face the repercussions. Your question I would also just, Oh, I'm so sorry, Brian, but I would really like to just quickly um, just prompt people to really consider the idea of being content neutral and the idea and concept of these kinds of messages that are sent out that say like, this doesn't reflect us because truly like whether or not you put out a trigger warning when there's a billboard of, of videos of fetuses being dissected, it's interesting. It's like a trigger warning is it's such an interesting concept in and of itself, but it's this kind of expression of care that the university is putting out in, in an attempt to absolve itself of its of its role, right? And and I think it's important to know like that these are decisions that are being made actively, and it's not it's not anybody's well. It's not anyone's, any particular person's fault, but really we need to be thinking about what it means when this space is allocated and what it means when these platforms are like, are, are contested or not contested or um, promoted or not promoted, right? And, and, and what that space means. And that was, that's really my, my last thought on it. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to quickly, Brian, before to tie back into the a question in the chat, Rachel Eckstein asked, you know, a, current, a concern about having students manage social media and do, does, does, does the state funded university, uh, what, what kinds of things can it post? And I think, you know, social media is its own sort of realm and has its own you know, highly fact specific considerations around who owns the account. Is it a private account or a official account and all those sorts of things. But all that aside, you know, I think that, you know, the strong argument is that that a university's social media accounts, I think that's what you're talking about, university accounts, not the individual's accounts, are government speech, right? So if you want to post something about anti-racism as the university, I don't think there's any problem with that. The question 
under the First Amendment is, do you punish people who disagree with that position? Not that you can't take that position. Grateful for tying into the question again from Rachel. And the second part of that, I think, is the is the, is the more personal. Do you have a right to tell students not to post anything political, despite the fact the university, so you've already mentioned that you know folks can share their points, but restricting that speech is where the problem comes. You know, tied into what folks have already been sharing, Anya in the in the um, Q and A asked about fighting disinformation, particularly in Caleb's case. You know, saying that Islam is terrorism or even persuasion for that simply false and disinformation. If you wanted to speak to Caleb specifically for this situation, um, how we could um, address the disinformation without censoring speech in the midst of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that in some ways that's the beauty of freedom of speech, right? The, the best way to combat it is by using your own voice and putting out, you know, what you believe to be the truth in that situation. So if, it, if it's a situation where you can't stop another person from speaking and you can't shut down the disinformation that they're putting out there, the best way you can correct it is to put out the correct information so that people have access to that. Um, and make sure that you know you do that in the, the most civic way possible, um, but making sure you're putting out what you believe to be the truth, you know, what is the correct information a kind of being, you know, a, a real life Snopes.com, you know, a real life fact checker, always making sure that you're speaking out when you do see disinformation so that people know it's not the truth. I, I, I just want to add that I think that this is a really, really, really tricky issue. Misinformation and disinformation is really, really, really tricky because we've seen, you know, I don't have to list the examples of ways in which it's really problematic to have you know, our social media platforms and other sort of public discourse flooded with things that are objectively, to the extent that there is objective truth, <laughs> these things are objectively not true. Um, and so, you know, I think we have to, the, the, this is one of those times when the ACLU's role is to, you know, acknowledge the problem and also point out all of the potential issues with some of the easy solutions that we might think about, right? I think, you know, just saying like Twitter take down stuff that's not true sort of makes a you know immediate sense, but the mechanisms, especially with technology companies of how are they gonna verify who's gonna be flagging, who's gonna be making the thumbs up, thumbs down decisions, those are really complicated and depending on the social media platform may be technically you know, impossible. Um, they're doing a lot. They're trying lots of different ways of doing it, but you know, also do we really trust Twitter to decide what is, true and what is not true? I don't think so. So as much as we might want to say, you know, Twitter do more, is Jack Dorsey the arbiter of truth? I hope not. So, you know, the thing that I, going back to an example, I always like to share from, from my work uh, in Africa, in Tanzania. So Tanzania was uh, a vibrant, thriving, you know, beacon of democracy in East Africa and across Africa for, for a generation. Uh, and then they got an authoritarian ruler, Magufuli, and he passed a suite of laws, uh, including one called the Statistics Act. And what the Statistics Act said is, if you're going to publish any fact, it has to be verified and approved by the Government Office of Statistics, right? And so he, he touted it is a part of what they call the cyber crimes suite of laws, right? He's trying to crack down on mis and disinformation online by making everything uh, verifiable by the government. So we understand why that you know, approach is problematic, but it also sort of is emblematic. People might say, oh, that could never happen here. You know, I'm not so sure, you know, like we are, I'm not an American exceptionalist. I think that, you know, things can change everywhere and anywhere. Uh, so when we think about rules for, for managing misinformation, I'm always sort of haunted by the Statistics Act and the idea that one day you could have to have to verify every fact with some neutral arbiter, which uh, I think becomes hugely problematic. And I mean, this is the same person who threw somebody in jail for calling him an idiot on Facebook. And these authoritarian impulses are not unique to Tanzania. They're not unique to Sub-Saharan Africa. If given an inch, any of our leaders of whatever political persuasion would run with that authority, I assure you. Marissa, thank you for naming the fragility of all this and 
you know, calling into question not just our rules and policies, our culture in a way that, you know, identifies um, this, we, you know, to your statement earlier, this is who we are. You know, some, of, some of this brokenness, some of the way in which we approach these things, you know, this is very much an integrated into our discourse. And so how are we doing better? Maybe the question, kind of the next question we have at least prepared and certainly welcome more folks in the audience. We're kind of coming up on close to the end, maybe about 12 minutes left. But our next question really bridges us into that harm conversation that we've talked earlier. This, that we know, I think, a little bit more about the problems. We've talked about the problems and the problematic elements. But what is it then as the outcome? You know, for, for a lot of our students, for a lot of folks across uh, our campuses and country, when they see harm or they feel harm, there's an offense, there's this immediate reaction, there's trauma that's involved in that. And there's a desire for some outcome. There's either desire for justice, potentially, desire for some healing, desire for some solidarity, affirmation that they've experienced this. And so I wonder from this group, you know, going a little bit past the, the questions, now how are we going towards solutions for folks experiencing this as the implications of free speech may be weaponized? Who wants to start us off? Go ahead, Marsha, I see you. This is when everyone puts their finger next to their nose and is like, not me, not me. Um, I don't think this is an easy question, right? I, I loved Emerson's idea of the simulation, right? That puts you in it, like you're emotionally in it, but it's not, it's not something you're totally in, right? Because when we start to talk about this is typically when our bodies and our hearts and our souls have been wounded. And, and you're telling me to have a conversation with that lecturer who brought that book and that somehow there the two of us will arrive at some understanding, right? Or Kaylin should have a conversation with someone who's, you know, speaking out and, and really their aim is to speak out until they, you know, agitate Kaylin, right? That, that, that's probably not the time to have this conversation. And yet we're, we're coming to this nexus where I think we're we're not teaching young people and, and in fact we're legislating what educators can do about what it is to be in community and be in discourse and to to understand that not everyone thinks or acts or believe as you do but you have to stop a minute and and listen and then um and then be willing to be angry and say what harm or hurt right and and I, I, I just think in the aftermath of the case study incident we talked about, I was the point person who got all the calls. You know, the president's office would transfer them, anybody would transfer them, right? So, so I become the arbiter of all things, right? But, but what I was amazed by, and I don't mean to bemoan anybody who sent their parents, but I, I talked to seven parents, right, who were speaking for their students, and I wanted to say, whoa, 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 send your students, right? I'm, I'm happy to talk to your student, but when you call me and say my child is hurting like like i want to say then let's talk to the child like right so so i keep thinking going back to that simulation going back to that learning that happens before it's this soul gut-wrenching kind of thing that says and what do you do like how do you own what you believe strongly about but listen to somebody because it in fact you know, I entered college as a moderate Republican and came out a Democrat. And I would say I did that in part because I listened to other people and I was like, holy crap, I'm wrong, right? Well, but, but it could be any number of things that, that make you understand something in a way you never understood it before. I lived in a Muslim country with a Muslim family in high school. That changed my mind, right? Like, like how do we listen to each other? I... I just want to piggyback on that a little bit and, and tie back to something that Kaylin was talking about earlier. I think it's a really, really crucially important point. Marsha talked about, you know, changing her views. And I think one of one one note I always like to touch with with students and, and anybody is part of the value of free speech is not to be naive, as Marsha was saying, in terms of we're going to talk someone off of, you know, out of their KKK hood with with reasoned, you know, logic or whatever. But we all have changed our minds about important things, right? And if you're not willing to acknowledge it, people you know, it's it, because we're so polarized, it's it's hard to imagine like switching teams in 2022, to be honest. But we all have changed our minds on important issues. Uh, and at least we know people who have. And I think for me, and I don't know if this distinction still works, but I think the, this is this for me is the distinction between a call-out culture 
and I don't you like to use this phrase, but what people call cancel culture. And I think when I talk about call out culture, I'm talking about, you know, identifying all of the ways that we think that things are problematic, right? Like that is using our free speech rights to say this, whether it's intentional, whether it's implicit, whether it's explicit, whatever it may be, it is incumbent upon all of us, people of good conscience, of good faith, to call out uh, injustice and to try to address it. To the extent that cancel culture exists, which I think is highly debatable, I don't think the way it's often used it exists, but to the extent it exists, and it's the problem I have is around the idea that people are whatever they have said or whatever is the worst thing that they've ever said. I mean, you use the phrase, Kalen, of a lapse in judgment, right? Like we have to maintain the idea that people can in fact have lapses in judgment. And Caleb, you talked about also sort of beliefs that feel like they're not just beliefs, but they're identities. And that, that makes a lot of sense, but it also can be problematic when we think about, okay, well, you said this, therefore you are this and you will forever be this, right? And so I think, you know, not to say that we should excuse anybody's, you know, harmful, hurtful, hateful views, uh, but re remembering that they are capable of redemption. Look, if I believe in prison abolition, if I believe in restorative justice and in our criminal justice system, in our schools, with my four-year-old and my seven-year-old, if I think it's better for them to talk through their big feelings than to be locked in their room by themselves, if I think that we shouldn't be excommunicating people from our community based on uh, mistakes that they've made, then I have to also believe that people are capable of changing their minds and, and being welcomed back into society, even if at some point they've expressed views that have been harmful. So uh, I think I really appreciate Marsha, you talking about the fact that we, we can and do change our minds. And as much as it's incumbent upon us to call out injustice, we also have to give each other grace. Yeah, I want to, I just want to add to this. I mean, this is something that I have like been slowly learning throughout my education process. I mean, I have like learned to kind of embrace compassion and empathy for people who I really viscerally disagree with. Right. And, and I'm still learning it and I am not obviously perfect. <laughs> at it. And um, I think that sometimes maybe you need to learn the lesson the hard way, but also like of course people make mistakes and of course people have perspectives that really feel like fundamental to who they are um so and when you're when you're challenging those perspectives it feels like you're challenging their being right and of course the like the really intense emotional response to that is going to be understandable um i also think like when i am confronted with things like this that just made me really mad um there is this need to like you feel like you've got to do something and sometimes you really just need to take a beat and as Emerson like feel your big feelings right feel those feelings and just recognize that like sometimes like things are out of your control and also your feelings about those are really important and valid and they speak to something about who you are and what you believe in and and acknowledge those right um for me as an outlet um I still have a lot to learn, but I do take up education both like in the way that I, um, you know, do my own personal research and like the projects that I uh, engage in, as well as like my role as an instructor, I, I kind of get to influence the young minds um, around me. And so I take that really, really seriously. And, um, you know, activism is such a helpful process in like trying to go through these big feelings. Um, but education on all ends of the spectrum and like what it means to persuade and what it means to um to like what those like reactions really do mean is is a big part of it like sometimes just being able to understand and name the situation is half the battle um so yeah that's kind of that's kind of some of the ways that i have figured out how to i don't know push back yeah, I just, I don't even know if I have anything to add, Brian. I, I just want to piggyback off of everything Marsha Emerson and Kaylin said. You know, it's, I just sit in deep gratitude. I know we're here in the top of the, at the top of the time that we're here together, but just the relationships just even here forming and just the considerations for one another 
How do we model that in our day-to-day -day work, whether it's amongst students, whether it's amongst colleagues, faculty, and classes, uh, beyond in kind of our interactions with family and friends? So I just encourage and implore you as you're either reading or watching this recording later on or as a live audience member, thank you for being such an engaged audience. We've had so many questions come to us and we've hopefully answered as many as we could. But I just sit in gratitude again for this group to be able to untangle a little bit the complexities, the messiness, to be able to highlight the things that we can move toward and yet also to you know caution ourselves as we get a little too fired up. Let's find those other outlets, of, as Kaylin just mentioned. How do we share and do these things without getting ourselves in trouble? Or if we're getting ourselves in trouble, make some good trouble for the reasons that we want to and know the consequences may be, take me away, as a part of the process for us of learning as a group. So again, grateful for each of you for being in space with us, for the attendees that are here. Um, I hope that you take away lots of nuggets of wisdom and you can implement that in your day-to-day -day life. But again, in gratitude, thank you grateful for you to be here. And thanks to our moderator. We appreciate it, Brian. You did a great job. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. Brian. <laughs> thanks, thank everybody. you, Brian, Nicole, everybody, Maddie, Marsha. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Be well, be safe. Bye, friends. Thank you.